So I first want to uh, thank President Cohen for hosting this event and also thank uh, CWA and the uh, AFSCME and AFG for their support during uh, the fights we had in Ohio, Wisconsin, and Indiana, uh, and, and some of the other fights we've had. Uh, I didn't want everybody to think I was like looking at emails or checking the scores or anything. My notes are on my phone, so technology is something new, right? Um, but I want to read to you uh, the statements that came from the governors early on um, in terms of collective bargaining fights that we had in places like Ohio, Wisconsin, and Indiana. And so <clears throat> what we saw during the campaign cycle was Governor Kasich, then candidate Kasich, come out and say, I want to break the backs of the teachers' union. He also said, if they strike, they should be fired. They're public employees. They've got good jobs, and they've got good pay. Scott Walker, the guy who we all love so much, <laughs> said, we can no longer live in a society where public employees are the haves and the taxpayers who foot the bills are the have-nots. He forgot that teachers, firemen, police officers are also taxpayers. I, didn't, I don't know how he came to that conclusion. Uh, but the one thing that we saw in these fights, especially with, in, in Indiana, Wisconsin, and Ohio, was that it was a concerted effort by many groups. And I must say that collective bargaining is an extension of our democracy. It is not something that we should take for granted. And I think sometimes, and this is a criticism of our, ourselves in labor, is that we take advantage of the things that we have. And, and part of the, the battle that we had in Ohio, West Virginia, I mean, Wisconsin and Indiana, was reminding those people who we would consider our natural allies, uh, family members, um, uh, our neighbors, that we were not these rich barons that they made us out to be. Um, there was a concerted effort to do a divide and conquer thing, which was, you know, try and make it seem like the private sector was against the public sector. And in Wisconsin, what I think turned it upside down was uh, the governor tried to carve out the police and the firemen. And what set that situation really into the right direction was that the firemen and the police officers said, you know what, we're going to stand by the teachers. We're going to stand by the, the city workers. We're going to stand with all the public employees. And so what you saw in Wisconsin was this great, I don't know, explosion of, of confidence that uh, a lot of folks, when you would go to the State House, would say, you know, I voted for Governor Kasich, I voted for Governor Walker. Because at the time, if you guys remember, there was a real desire for folks out there to try and get Republicans and Democrats together to fix the problems. Not go into office and create a war on collective bargaining rights, not, collect, not create a war on women's rights, but to try and fix the economic problems that we were facing. And so, uh, when, when the governor, governor Scott Walker took the war to us, I think that what he did was miscalculated the fact that people had a real desire to have the problem solved. And what happened was when he, and this is especially interesting in Wisconsin and Ohio, was that public employee unions actually said, we will be more than happy to come to the table to talk about these issues and work collaboratively with you to solve the problems because they masked it under a, a budgetary issue, or it was a budget crisis. And there were budgetary crises. But what I think changed the tone of everything was when the general public re realized that the quote unquote teachers unions and, and the uh, different public sector unions were willing to come to the table and negotiate. And then as the general public started to look at what we had made in concessions, I mean, Teachers in Ohio had not had races, in, in Cincinnati, for example, had not had a raise in six years. And so once the general public started to realize how unfair this was, uh, then you started to see the sway of public's opinion not going after coll collective bargaining, but saying this was not the right thing to do. It was not going to solve any problems. And so after Wisconsin kind of blew up, we also dealt with Indiana and we dealt with Ohio, and they were all kind of hitting us at the same time. And I can tell you that in Indiana, the attacks were specific to teachers unions. They wanted to limit our, collect our, collect our ability to collective bargain, 
But then they wanted to make it based out of um, formulas on, in, in terms of testing. They wanted to make it, make it so that we had a diff more difficult time bargaining for wages and health care. And these are the cornerstones of the things that folks who join a union, and I shouldn't say folks who join a union, people everywhere want to be able to work for a good wage retire with dignity, and if they have a family, send their children to school and make sure that they have a better life than them. And what was the sense that people got was that they were now taking that away. And as we went through this fight, I can, I can tell you that in, in Indiana especially, and that fight is still going on, is that those folks who we would thought, you know, would have, would have not been on, on our side um, started to say, wait a minute, this is outrageous. Um, we might need to rethink this. And so with the encouragement of some Republicans, the Democrats in Indiana decided they were going to walk out, and they left the state. To me, a, small, a state like Indiana set the tempo. Wisconsin, don't get it, don't get it uh, confused. Wisconsin was, the, was like the strike, okay? It was the, it was the stone that started this movement. But Indiana and Ohio kind of were the, were the things that were the body of it, okay? Um, and so when those Democrats left Indiana, those vibes went across the Midwest. And so what happened is when we went over to Ohio, and I remember driving up I-70, going back and forth from state to state, um, then there was, a, there was a petition drive in Ohio where we had to collect, I think, 300,000 signatures. Well, what we ended up doing was collecting 1.3 million signatures. This spoke volumes. It spoke volumes. And then the challenge was, how do we turn 1.3 million signatures into votes? It's one thing to get someone to sign a piece of paper and say, I don't agree with something. It's another thing to get them to the polls in an off-year election. And the way we decided to do that was not make this a union issue, but make it a community issue. And we depended on our partners like Clue, LACLA, CBTU, A. Philip Randolph, uh, 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 many, uh, many different groups that are constituencies of the AFL-CIO to fight this fight. Because what happens is when you demonize a teacher and you say, those teachers, they make too much money, you'll be surprised how your next door neighbor views you as that teacher who makes <laughs> too much money. So during the petition process, what we decided to do was ask our members to not go and collect petitions at school with your, co your co-workers, but to go out of your home and turn left or turn right and talk to the people on your street, across the street, and let them know who you were. Teachers don't get into the profession because they think they're going to be rich. They get into the profession because they want to affect and change lives. And so that had been lost. And when teachers went out, and start communicating what their dreams and hopes were for the students, we've seen a sea change. The, the most egregious law we're fighting right now in terms of collective bargaining is the emergency financial manager bill in Michigan. This bill is truly a black eye to our democracy. For those who don't know what that bill is, it basically says if a municipality is facing financial emergency, then the governor can appoint one person to come in there into the municipality and basically fire all the elected officials. So if you vote for a mayor in your hometown, they can be removed. If you voted for a city council, they can be removed. And all the collective, all the contracts in the city are now marked void. Now, I don't know. The last time I checked, that was dictatorship right there. And to me, it shows to how far folks will go to end our ability to have that seat at the table. I think when we look at these different attacks on collective bargaining, the thing that we forget, and I, I was discussing this outside, is that a lot of us in the United States and worldwide have our favorite soccer players, our favorite football players, our favorite actors and actresses. But these are individuals who have collective bargaining rights. If it's okay for Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson to have collective bargaining or to have a contract to play basketball, why shouldn't it be okay for a teacher? Why shouldn't it be okay for a janitor who works in a the school? These are the folks who make 
our society better? So there's a question we have to ask ourselves. If it's an, a, a collective bargaining issue here in the United States, are we going to be willing to stand together to fight a collective bargaining issue around the world? Because it's something that we're seeing now is that it's like a germ is spreading. And what we've heard from our, my colleagues on both either side of me is that it's not just limited to the United States. And I, I like to tell people, if this was not such a, a grand you know, a issue isolated to just say Ohio, why are folks spending $100 million per campaign to defeat our rights, not just to collective bargaining, but to also vote? We have to truly ask ourselves, you know, as President Cohen said, are we willing to let the last lines of our democracy be crippled or broken down because we're tired? Or are we going to stand up and fight? Because tomorrow when I leave to go to Wisconsin, I can tell you that the eyes of our country after May 8th will turn to Wisconsin because it is not just a referendum on Scott Walker, but it's, on a, it's a referendum on collective bargaining, people's rights that works everywhere. And so I would hope that everyone in this room would make sure that they turn their eyes to the Wisconsin battle. And if you have family and friends in that area, call them up and tell them how to vote. But more importantly, stay, stay in tune to the battle because we need all the support we can get. And so with that, I'll, I will close.